Good afternoon, everyone. I hope that uh, those two videos got you ready for the session. I was I was dancing along to the second one. It was getting me in the mood. I liked the music. I was struggling to stay seated until you get up and bop along. Uh, I'd like to wish you a very warm welcome to this e-tail and, and digital travel summit webinar that's being brought to you in partnership with Akata and Payoneer. Uh, my name is Danny Levy and I'm the Managing Director of Worldwide Business Retail uh, Research, sorry, e-tail and digital travel summit. And I'm looking forward to hosting the webinar session with everyone today. The panel discussion will focus on the topic of unlocking global growth and expansion with cross-border payments, which I will be moderating. This is your opportunity to voice your opinion and get answers to questions that are important to you. And I'm delighted to say that I'm joined on the panel discussion today by Kanan Rajaratnam, who's the CX and ePayments Director at Zalora, Mohammed Hafiz, who's the head of, e who's the head of Payments and Financial Services with AirAsia, uh, Tom Donnelly, who's the VP for Asia Pacific with Ikata, and Stephen Kam, the Business Development Director at Payoneer. Hey everyone, how are you doing? We're good, thanks. Great. Good, thanks, Very good. As a reminder, if you have any questions during the panel discussion today, you can send them in via the chat window, and I'll come to these at the end of the session. And everyone that stays here until the end of the session today will be entered into the prize draw for the brand new 2021 iPad Mini. You do have to be here at the end of the session to stand a chance to win. And I'll announce the winner at the end of the session today. So in the interest of time, let's get straight into the discussion. So the first question I've got for you all today, and it'd be great if you could do a quick introduction of yourselves uh, just before you would get into the question as well, is what is the most important lesson you've learned about digital commerce in the past year during the pandemic? And Canon, it'd be great if you could kick us off. Right. Thanks, Danny. That's a great question. My name is Kanan. I'm the Regional Director for Customer Experience and Payments uh, for Zalora. So I looked after the strategy and also operational aspects of payments for the Zalora group. So quite interesting. Uh, um, so do, when the pandemic first hit us um, somewhere in uh, late 2019, we haven't feel the heat yet. And uh, what happened is um, right after that, we saw some accelerated adoption in some channels, some payment channels, while in some geographicals. And uh, while some markets remain agnostic to the to the change, uh, and the real challenge was uh, in driving change in markets that were high stickiness uh, to traditional payment channels, a lot of times we, we realized that this could require additional investments from our end. And this came way earlier before even the pandemic where we invested quite heavily in, in terms of like offline stores and also in terms of pop-up stores really creating the presence that Zalora is available and establishing the trust. And that led to the customers eventually uh, adopting the, 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 the shopping experience. And I think one of the key things we have noticed is that when, when a new customer comes on board, there's always a high tendency of them trying with less risky payment channels, which is cash and delivery. Uh, and then um, after they're comfortable, they move on to a different channel. Uh, but however, during the, the pandemic, we also noticed that uh, this was not the case anymore. Uh, a number of new customers that was acquired was also attempting to use digital channels as a payment as a payment uh, medium for for shopping with Zalora. So that's what we noticed. Over to you, Danny. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Mo, can I come to you next? Sure. Hey, Danny. Thanks. Um, thanks, Ricardo. Thanks, uh, uh, Pioneer, for for inviting me today. So I head up um, payments and financial services for AirAsia as well. And the, the, the question I always get is um, AirAsia is only an airline. And what do we know about retail? Um, interestingly enough, AirAsia, although that brand has been synonymous with flights, um, we actually took a very significant pivot into a variety of digital businesses um, a little before the pandemic hit. We just kind of accelerated that um, when it came aboard. Now, one thing we did realize was as we built out the environment, we've always been, Erich has been a online airline from day one. So we've seen people online from day one anyway, but in those days, well, 16 years ago, it's always been about card. So one of the biggest lessons, we, which was very, very visible to us was as we start looking at retail and other services that we provide like fresh, which is actually our, our fresh food, uh, business plus the food business and the right hailing business that AirAsia is now doing and is also available in Singapore. 
is that the sentiment around what is digital commerce to a consumer has now kind of leveled off. To them, it's exactly the same perception. They want the same way that they actually do. They don't want the ability or they don't want the need to sit down and pick a payment type anymore. You know, it, payments already hygiene. The digitization of payments is almost a given. Now, what's making, what's kind of made it worse is I think they've kind of gotten used to the fact that they pick up the phone and, and they could do anything they want now. Book a car, buy milk, book a ticket, fly somewhere. They've kind of expected everything to work the same way. So for us, um, we focus on the consumer experience um, a lot more because we feel that that is what our customers are all about and, and for us to sit down and, and deliver to them, which means payments needed to be somewhat, we use the phrase internally as invisible and not visible at all. It needs to be something that is a given. It has to work all the time. And I think Kanan raised a very good point. The transition between payment types was also something we saw. When the pandemic hit, shift away from card as a, as a typical piece as people started getting worried about credit was very visible for us because we, we run very localized country based business in ASEAN. So a lot of people started going into direct debit some even into, they couldn't do COD, we were doing COD, we saw that drop off the, 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 the edge and the, to zero actually. But the sudden adoption of digital was massive. Um, so we, we started to have to ramp up on the other side. Fortunately for us, we just had to accelerate what we were planning to do. And I thought that was a very interesting um, visible because um, characteristics, because right now the buyers are not the typical buyers we saw. We had purchases that were 10 years old. We got 15 year old guys coming to us buying stuff. And we have the typical buyers like people our age anyway who buy for the family as well. So I think that who the customer is also changed, right? Because the consumers changed. Thanks, Matt. Uh, Stephen, can I come to you? Of course, thank you, Danny. Um, my name is Stephen and I look after partnerships uh, across APEC for Payneer. So I agree more that um, you know customer experience is is very very important. Um, maybe not just uh, for payments. Like and I agree, like payments should be invisible, should be sitting on the background, and should be ultimately safe as well for the consumer to use it. Um, but it's, it's not just you know the payments flow. I think the whole customer buying journey should be relatively uh, easy one, a smooth one. Um, you know, I think having a Google sheet for you to fill up a order and then having WhatsApp to confirm the order and, you know, maybe sending a screenshot of your bank transaction, that doesn't really work out anymore. Um, it may be good for, you know, a business that's just starting out, but as you develop your brand, as you develop your presence, uh, whether it's locally, regionally, I think it's important to think not only of payments, uh, but also the whole customer journey. Um, and then that is kind of where it brings you, you know, separates the best from, from the good. Yeah, completely agree. Tom, can we can we get to you last to introduce yourself and, and give us some of your insights? Certainly. Thanks, everybody. Nice nice to see you all. Uh, Tom Donnelly, I worked for Arcata, which is now a MasterCard company as of June. Um, we are an identity verification provider. If you tuned in early, you saw our lovely commercial um, uh, right before the very funky Pioneer commercial. Excellent. I was dancing, too. Mm -hmm. um, my, I've been in the payments and fraud industry for 15 years um, and, and leading the effort for Arcata to expand into Asia Pacific. Um, excited to have AirAsia as one of our first uh, customers that we signed when we, we opened the office here two years ago. I think, Danny, to your question about what, what did I observe during the pandemic. So uh, Google and Tomasic do uh, pretty extensive research around the growth of digital commerce. Um, the most recent statistics I've seen for Southeast Asia is that we've added 75 million new consumers. So some are the 10 or 15 year olds that, that Mo mentioned. Some of them are 75, 80 year olds who would never have used digital commerce before we were forced during the pandemic. So what does that mean, right? It means two things as, as we roll out our content for today. Um, these are now people who are susceptible to social engineering. They're not familiar with why, why wouldn't I share my password? What's wrong with that? Um, there's a lot wrong with that, but if you're new, you might not know that. Se okay. Second thing that we have to be paying attention to, Danny, is then these are all new identities that are in the pool of identities that can be breached and used by these sophisticated crime rings to perform fraud against Zalora or Asia, Air Asia. 
Um, and so I think that that's what we're focused on right now and what we've seen in the pandemic. Yeah, I think I agree. I mean, especially on the some of the older consumers. I mean, you've seen a lot of the kind of the first time older consumer really move online now, but now this has been around for quite some time. It's becoming second nature to them though, isn't it? They're, they're much more comfortable transacting and, and shopping online. So maybe to that point, I, I, have you seen other consumer behavior change during the pandemic, Tom? And has that, there been any changes that have surprised you the most? Yeah, consumers are extremely impatient. So mm. uh, consumers want a frictionless, easy onboarding. And um, we, we work with fraud teams all over the globe, some of the world's most sophisticated fraud prevention teams. They need a certain amount of friction to have enough identity about that consumer to be able to have a confidence level in that identity to allow that consumer to borrow money, to fly, to uh, interact on a social media platform. And so I think that's what I've seen is that the consumers are impatient and yet they don't want their data compromised and they don't want someone to open an account in their name. So the fraud versus friction is the continued tension in the industry from, from our perspective. And is the is there a payoff that you're seeing there, Mo? Maybe you could give some of your, your experiences there. I mean, is there, a, is there a balance you can strike? Well, that's always been a challenge, I think, aside from the fact that they are also impatient. Um, somehow, with the amount of screen time that everybody's getting right now, they seem to think they're much smarter than before. So, um, not only that, they not only get impatient, but they also feel that because of what they now know, they realize there's a lot more that is available to them. So as a merchant, the challenge we have to close that sale is now more critical because the moment we don't deliver to that consumer expectation, they would skip and go off to somebody else. And it could be for the very simple thing of, I just had to click one extra time. Why are you asking me for this TNC? You know, why are you even asking me for a CVV, which to be very honest, two years ago was expected. But right now, I think the advent of um, non-card based payment, for example, alternative payments, and, and I think we've seen so many wallet developments through the years. I think for us, I mean, my technology guys are basically screaming bloody murder every time I bring somebody else on board. I have 167 different alternative payment types that we support because of the ASEAN market. And we do that because we want to sit down and support the local, uh, local markets accordingly. And that poses a very big challenge because if we feel that the customer experience is key and we want to provide a universal payment um, or ubiquitous payment experience throughout whatever payment type, that becomes a massive problem for us. And then balancing out with what Tom was saying is, is key because we want to keep the business, we want to keep the money and we want to keep it safe. We need that friction, but then it's almost like a science to how much friction is acceptable. Yeah. And 167 payment types, is there a, is there a point where you can offer too much choice to the customer and they end I up kind of it, paralyzed? Or? I, I, well, I wouldn't say paralyzed. I think for, <laughs> for the business guys that keep yeah. telling us to, to turn it on, they don't care. Mm -hmm. but one thing we do see based on the data that we collect is that any more than three, I think there's an old study that says any more than three people would get fed up and not use it. And I think there's a lot of reality behind that. But aside from the options, it's also around the simplicity. Mm -hmm. Because right now, I think with digital payments, a lot of people have this a digitized version of top of wallet. The first thing they'll reach out for, be it a grab or be it a, a local payment type or whatever it is, right? There's always that convenience and that convenience is driven by loyalty points, rewards, or whatever extra plus points that they're going to get, right? Um, so yeah, uh, we try, but challenging times requires challenging measures. So the, the more effective the net for us to sit down and support the business, I guess we'll have to do what we need to do. Yeah. Have you seen... Um I mean, consumers, like you said, will often go down the path of least resistance, but have you seen consumers move towards a certain type of payment uh, in terms of their behavior? Yeah, because I think uh, we do. I, I think what's most visible is the fact that they, they try and double game the system, right? Mm. Um, when you look at wallet solutions, I think traditional financial instruments topping up wallets is one way. 
And banks, of course, want you to certainly use their products. They provide loyalty points and other extra benefits and vouchers and everything else to do so. And I think with the, the, the consumers getting much smarter at how they want to do this, they found different ways to sit down and game everybody that's going to do that. So they earn points on the top up, and then they earn points on the usage, and then they go to a points consolidator and liquefy everything. So I think the consumers, like I said, they, they, they're getting more sophisticated. Yeah. They know how to sit down and do it. But I think that's also driven by value, because all of us would have had point somewhere and I think if someone was to say I have one way for you to sit down and realize put a dollar figure to every other little point you have you probably say let's go and I think that's the, 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 the attraction so it's gone towards um, direct debit as well as wallet because I think the 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 fact that everybody's expecting digitization of um, payments to almost emulate physical cash is real. Mm -hmm. The value of money needs to be transferred within that five, six seconds that is equivalent to a typical me giving you 10 bucks. And they expect digitized value to follow that as well. And because of that, I think a lot of people tend to prefer immediacy of um, fulfillment. They do direct, you know, they do ACH type payments more. Uh, they do uh, P2P like payments more as well. Uh, for merchants like us, that poses a challenge, of course, you know, reconciliation, the data points as well. I think, you know, we work with Danny and the team, uh, with Tom and, and the Ikata team, because the thing is for us, payments needs to be multitude, uh, it has multi-channel requirements. Mm -hmm. Our customers would be, the same guy would be on a wallet today, and <coughs> next hour, he's basically on a card. We still need to know it's him. Right? Yeah. So it's becoming more and more challenging for us. Yeah. Thanks for sharing, Mark. Canon, can I come to you next to share some of the changes you've seen in consumer behavior? Sure, Danny. So I can really echo some of the points that Mo and Tom mentioned, right? With regards to convenience, I think that's going to be key driver. So I always thought it's, it's, it's kind of weird that my role uh, encapsulates uh, customer experience and payments. Then I realized that during this the past five minutes of conversation, right? Uh, it's oh, basically, I always bring feedback to, to my management team that these are the like payment channels that customers are requesting and, and now i understand they consolidated so that i can solve the problems that i bring to the table so it, it, it makes a lot of sense now right uh but yeah um convenience is key uh so we noticed that with regards to evolution of products card on file tokenization wallet linkage and network optimization have really improved helped us improve our top line and salvage the the leakage of the revenues that we were used to have before uh, but I think one interesting trend or one angle that could bring a different perspective to this question would be we were quite complacent to the fact that COD customers would be fine to have close contacts during the pandemic and still exchange physical cash. And however, within the first wave and, and then within like a couple of days, uh, once the first wave hit us somewhere in March 2020, if I'm not mistaken, we were receiving quite a lot of feedback that, hey, maybe you guys should consider having like a, uh, a non-contact ability to transact, but we still going to be a COD customer. So we're not going to move to digital uh, digitalization, but we will prefer to have the, the physical, uh, I mean, we, we prefer to have the exchange of cash, but in a more digitalized way. So technically it is digitalization, but in a, in a more, um, what you call passive way. So what we had to do within that three, two to three days, right? We really had to go to all our logistic partners and also looking into options available. And we launched a QR, static QR-based payment uh, in, in multiple countries. Um, if we started off with Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia, it, it was a, quite a monumental task given that we only had like a couple of days to go live. But then again, uh, I think with the ability of the fintechs and also the ability of the even banks to, to be able to procure and, you know, provide the solution immediately, that really helped us to go live. And uh, today, I think we have this offering in almost every country that we operate through directly our, our logistic partners or through the Solara Drive themselves or logistics teams. Even though you went live in just a few days, I presume now that's been optimized over time, has it? Uh, yes, yes, yeah. for sure. So yeah. the reconciliation was a, a mess in the beginning, of course, right? We, with static QRs and, and manual reconciliation. But along the way, uh, we have a more, uh, uh, what you call, dynamic process 
to, to this uh, feature now. Fantastic. And Stephen, can I come to you last from what you're seeing in the market? Sure. Um, maybe I'll just start with what has uh, really surprised me about the consumer behavior during the pandemic. I think the first thing was um, a lot of the consumers and businesses started to sort of support each other. There was a lot of push for, you know, buying locally, supporting local businesses, and to some extent also using local payment methods. Um, I think that that is also helped by uh, local regulation, government coming in, stepping in, pushing for the digital transformation. And, you know, in some cases, the uh, government even provides subsidies for businesses that's going digital or, you know, putting subsidies into digital wallets. So there was really a big push from, I suppose, uh, from top down and also from sort of bottoms up. Um, but, you know, to a certain extent, I think, you know, uh, we tend to want to help only, you know, if it's easy for us to, to help, right, as well. So um, there are some basic fundamental layers that still need to be there, uh, including, for example, accepting local payments, you know, whether if I'm doing a, a P2P bank transfer to you, um, it should not be too difficult for me to want to make payment to you or buy from you, right? Uh, so in that sense, you know, because of the intention to help like local businesses and, and uh, you know, local consumers coming together, um, there has been a big push for uh, local payment methods, uh, localization of uh, the businesses, you know, and I think that that sort of, you know, really helped the community. In a way, the pandemic has kind of make us closer to each other, even though, you know, we should not be doing that. But yeah, yeah, this is um, what I, I saw in the market. It definitely put us all in the same boat, didn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so, Stephen, can I can I stay with you for a second? And I mean, you were mentioning um, some of the local payment methods there, but in terms of cross border, um, what digital trends have you seen in the last few years that have had a significant impact on the on the cross border business landscape? I think this is probably also. Um, Stepping on a little bit on what Mo has shared earlier, I think you know going local while you turn global is important. So having local payment methods, and it could be 167 local payment methods or even more, um, and you see two more, you know, two new ones every day, right? Uh, there's just so much fragmentation and and you know differences in uh, across the market, especially uh, across ASEAN or Southeast Asia. And um, I think this is important for businesses that is growing cross-border or selling internationally, that they need to be aware of some of the local nuances, uh, the local differences, the way they make payment, you know, the way they react to your, to your website. And it's not just about language, you know, of course, language is uh, important as well. You should have a sort of a, a localized version uh, of your store. But, you know, beyond that is really understanding, you know, the consumers locally because people buy from things and and you know brands they, are, they they know or they understand right so when they are interacting with a business that maybe could be foreign to them today um, but they see something familiar right whether is it a payment method um, you know the bank they have been using for like 20 years things like that they are familiar with it it makes them feel a little bit safer when they're trying to buy stuff from you so we see that a lot um, and I see and it's definitely translated into increase in volumes for local payment methods, alternative payment methods and even fintech, you know, across the region, just purely because there's a gap, um, you know, where the traditional incumbent, the banks, they, you know, they, they, they have um, ignored a certain customer segment for a long time, you know, the underbank, the unbanked people. So the fintech players are coming in to fill up the gap uh, and then providing innovative solutions and therefore, you know, uh, forcing other traditional incumbents to come up with uh, new new innovative solutions as well. So, so that that trend is uh, something I see you know across the across the markets recently. Yeah, and you mentioned when when you when you go overseas, you've, you've really got to be aware of the the local differences. Just make sure you get a handle on that quite quickly. A any recommendations there for the for the people watching on on some of the ways you can can do that well? I think you know. It's just so many of them that uh, it's better to kind of, you know, in a way, put your hands in, in, in the hands of the expert, right? Um, you know, maybe going through a uh, somebody, a company, a brand that's been doing this for a long time, uh, a local expert uh, that is able to at least, you know, help you simplify some of the pain points, the problems, you know, um, perhaps connecting to a, to a fintech company that has multiple payment methods so that you can 
at least you know uh, try some of these payment methods first to enable the payment methods in different markets and to see which one are the ones that's more popular, which one are the ones that resonates well with the customer, and also to perhaps you know get advice from uh, the, the partners that you're working with. Um, and I think all of this uh, really helps, right? When you're, you're going to the market, you're not doing it alone. You're doing it with a partner. The partner has been there for some time. They know what have uh, what are the mistakes that they have done, and therefore you can learn from them. So that would be my piece of advice. Yeah, I agree. Definitely helps to be able to lean on a on a partner with with their local expertise uh, as you went to new markets. So, Stephen, in terms of Payoneer, how, how does Payoneer help in terms of cross border? I think there's two parts to the Payoneer, right? The, the first part is really the direct to consumer facing part, uh, which mm-hmm. is kind of like a B two C, and the second part is more of the supplier or the seller seller facing part. So let's talk about the uh, which is B two B. So let's talk about the B two C first. Now, direct to consumers, um, we have a payment orchestration platform, and the payment orchestration platform really allows you to connect to one partner, which is us, to have access to multiple payment methods because uh, we have connected to hundreds of uh, payment methods in the past 15 years that we have been operating. And um, we have done all the heavy lifting, all the connections is in place. Um, and you know, all you need to do is just to connect to us and you have access to all these different payment methods. It's kind of like going to the supermarket, you know, you want to get a beer and then you have a whole shelf of like 30 beers uh, from different markets, you know, just sitting there, right? So it's easier for you, right? You don't have to buy directly from them. Uh, different market so that allows you the convenience uh, the expertise and um you know uh, and also we have done all the connections for a long time right we know who the partners are we know who the players are and you know we can easily also provide some advice on which are the more trending sort of payment methods which are the ones that doesn't come with disputes or charge back things like that um some you know stuff that is below the hood that maybe you know, uh, not many people know about now that's that's the kind of the b2c part now on the b2b part um, we facilitate cross-border payments, especially to sellers, right? So if you are a marketplace, um, you are the supermarket, right? You need to make payment back to the supplier of the beer, um, and and these guys could be like overseas. We help you to facilitate the payment, you know, uh, cross-border, you know, in a much more effective and efficient way, uh, as compared to the the more traditional way of making payment, you know, using bank transfers, and, and it's much faster. And um, also, we have an ability to send money to thousands of uh, receivers at one time. So if you are a, a marketplace and you have many small sellers, uh, some of the freelancers perhaps, you know, um, sending money to them in a the traditional way can be very costly and uh, not very efficient. Uh, but through us, you know, we have APIs that can help you to facilitate the payout. Um, even small amounts, I think, you know, this, this is where our value proposition comes in. We have about four to five million small businesses that are sitting around the world. Um, and they are, have been using Payoneer to receive funds from different marketplaces for a very long time now. Uh, so, so that's one we can help you to send money to them easily. And secondly, if you are a marketplace and you are thinking to expand to different markets, I think it's kind of um, you know it's useful to partner with Payoneer because of our customer seller base that we have, four to five million of them, um, and that can help you to get more sellers. Right? Uh, without sellers, you know your marketplace is. It is dead, right? You have no products to, to offer to the consumer. So it's important to get good sellers. It's important to get a variety of sellers. And uh, this is where when you partner with Payoneer, then you have access to all this space. Well, thank you. Sounds like if you partner with Payoneer, you, you can really kind of focus on what you should be focusing on, on, on what you're good at. And you can you can get Payoneer to kind of take care of the rest in terms of that, that expertise and, you know, moving into new markets, like you said. Absolutely. Yeah. Fantastic. So, so um, when it comes to e-payments, I wanted to ask, in your, in your opinion, what, what's the biggest misconception you see at the moment when it comes to e-payments? And then, Canon, could I could I go to you first for this one? Ah, uh, sure. So, any one of the one of the misconception when I speak to smaller businesses, um, and at the height of the pandemic, they're still using traditional cash exchange, right? So, I always ask them, like, why do not? Why do you not offer like a QR based payment or digital wallets and whatnot? And and the all the the common response that I always get from these people is that hey, why should I pay like extra one or two percent for a digital payment when I get all the cash for myself? Especially in the low margin businesses. And, and I think that's a misconception because when you view it in that point of view, what you're losing out is actually 
the customers traffic that these payment channels could drive to you because some of these some of these uh, payment channels are on an aggressive marketing drive uh, that could be one and then the real advantage of having a, a digital payment is also on controlling leakages um, improving efficient processes with regards to conciliation uh, also with with cash and delivery especially for retail we experience high number of cancellations uh, this is quite prominent as we look into a more granular level of customers feedback where they say that hey i have not gotten my salary yet can i postpone the delivery so that i can pay at the later stage and i think with an online payment or digitalized payment the payment is prepayment where you receive the cash up front and also it's it's a good for especially in a retail e-commerce business it's good for cash flow we we have not delivered the product yet but we still have the cash up front so this could be a, a huge help in in some way and then there's a very unlikeliness for the customers to reject the parcel if they have already upfronted the cash right so that's that's from a merchant perspective from a customer perspective right Um, I think um, if you have a customer base that is a bit more reluctant to use or to onboard the digital uh, payment channels, it's what you can do is play a more active role uh, together with the partner or even on your own to really spur the demand for digital payments, and that's precisely how we we have been doing on the last few years to reduce the dependency on the cash collections. Uh, and I think uh, that, in a nutshell, could. Could kind of help to to propel the e-payment adoption. That's it. Tom, can I come to you next for for some of your thoughts around e- e-payments? Sure. Yeah, and I, I, there was a, a brief comment I'd like to make around cross-border. Our last uh, question, Danny. Mm. Yeah, and sure. I think from from Akata's perspective, the key thing we see related to growing cross-border. If if you're a Lazada and you're in six countries. Or your AliPay, and you're in over a hundred, you have an issue with a, a cold start or having no familiarity with the identities in that region. It might be the naming configurations in Malaysia or Thailand or Brazil. Um, it could simply be that you just don't have experience with with consumers there or a small business. And so I think that's one key thing that that's a challenge that businesses have to overcome as they become more cross border. I think you know a misconception around. Um, e-payments ties into marketing. So there, there's a long-standing um, saying that I that I use frequently, and that's if you're accepting payments online, you're dealing with fraud. It's the yin and the yang. It's the breathing in. It's the breathing out. Um, and increasingly, um, if you're spending money to draw consumers to your business, Zalora, how many how many promo codes are out there right now? Can I like more than two? Um, I, sure, I can tell. Definitely not. <laughs> Probably hundreds. So, so, so if you're spending money on marketing, you want to get legitimate consumers in. So I think that's that's one component. It's like uh, fraud isn't just um, about like pre- keeping bad actors out. It's actually keeping legitimate uh, consumers uh, behaving appropriately. So it's that promo abuse, voucher abuse. Um, if I've got loyalty miles on my airline, I don't want someone else accessing those because that's that's real money. Um, I'm planning my future based on those points. So I think those are some of the things that we're seeing, Danny, related to electronic payments and and cross border activity. Yeah, and do you, do you see that a, a trap that people are falling into is is actually blocking genuine users? So they're actually stopping them from transacting. You don't want to treat your good customers yeah. like criminals. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and 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 for everyone that's on this or might watch the recording, like if you're utilizing a block list or a blacklist, that really you should really rethink that because uh, you know Mo has a Gmail address. I'm not going to advertise it on this session, but I have it if you'd like it. Um, <laughs> and it, it may be compromised at some point, but he, if someone uses his Gmail to open an account and borrow some money, he doesn't want to be blocked. On that business, right? And so he's going to take possession of that Gmail back. So that that component of having a dynamic way to verify identity and using layers of prevention, as opposed to a definitive um, blacklist, is, is the wave of the future. Yeah, and maybe I'm a, I'm a beginner in this area, but in terms of this identity. Um, Measures and the layers of approval is that something that's difficult to set up? Does it take long? How, I mean, just very quickly, how would how would you go about doing something like that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think you learn from those that have gone before. So mm -hmm. part of what Akata is doing is we've been working with multinationals for many years. We understand those best practices and we're bringing them here to regional companies that are growing. Um, I would say it is difficult. Air Asia has yeah. gone through a lot of evolution in the last couple of years. We're only a part of that. Um, yeah. Partly they, they do research on best practices. They, they've done very thorough RFPs that look at the solutions. And ultimately you want to spend enough on prevention, but not so much that you're duplicating efforts and, and wasting money. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Mo, can we, can we come to you now to, to share what some of your thoughts? Sure. Um, for us, the, the way we look at e-payments is slightly broader. Um, mm -hmm. The thing is, I think the main misconception around e-payments is everybody talks about acceptance only. Because um, that's always been where the customer's uh, interaction occurs and that's when the money flow starts. But, you know, to, to what Stephen was saying, um, we work with, with players like Payoneer uh, to do double-layered uh, orchestration. Um, we use them to sit down and give us speed to market, the ability for us to pivot much, much quicker. Because one of the things that we do realize is the sentiments around payment types and market level sentiments change very, very quickly. And we have to balance um, the investment in time, infrastructure and capability um, into whether or not that's going to be right. So for us, we work with large players like Pioneer to sit down and get that, that, that bundle of capabilities. But for us, we also orchestrate as well on our side so that we turn it on and turn it off very, very quickly without having to sit down and do the reintegration before, giving us the ability to pivot much quicker and then go into different segments. Now for us, that was important because in a lot of um, peers that I speak to, a lot of their businesses are single vertical products. For us, Tony is kind of throwing a spanner in the works and he's, he, he's got a ride hailing, he's got food, he's got deliveries, he's got airline, he's got hotel. So for a payments guy like me, I've got more white hair than I'm showing. Um, <laughs> I've had to sit down and create a universal payment flow that works for the customer that achieves that expectation. That universal ubiquity around what payments is and still make it invisible. And the ability to pivot very, very quickly if it doesn't work because that's how fast the business will have to change. So to what Tom is saying, the concept of e-payments needs to be a whole package deal. It's not only about the customer. It is a lot about the customer because that's the touch point that everybody sees. But then as the transaction flows into the pipeline, the ability to see what Tom and Ikata and the team brings gives us an ability for us to sit and ascertain a good customer versus bad. And then at the back, when we look at the economics, um, an orchestration platform, even though we orchestrate a little bit because of the multi-country, multi-currency player that we do uh, uh, our own selves, we, we work with the likes of Pioneer to sit down and be able to sit down and turn on and turn off and pivot, activate, deactivate as required, um, has been key. Otherwise, I think we would be in a whole lot of trouble given the fact that we're primary an airline and not everything else. So I think the fact that we're still here um, has a lot to do with the fact that our business is almost in this last two years shifted away from just flights and hotels but the ability for us to pivot digitally everywhere so I think that's the key thing and I think for a business yes every merchant you speak to is all about MDR it's all about a terminal it's all about a website it's all about an API but everybody forgets after that transaction comes in how do you secure it how do you flow it how do you check on it how do you make sure your customers are still at it and how do you reuse it people don't look at it very well so e-payments is much broader and i think we need to work with the best of the breed for us because i think the crooks are getting smarter tom don't they <laughs> they're getting much much smarter and um we need to secure that opportunity while it still exists so i mean that's my take on, on the biggest misconception i think yeah maybe we can stay there i think we've touched on it a little bit now but um we've been talking about kind of fraud and uh tom touched on it earlier as well around how it can create friction for customers it can cause cart abandonment um at the same time you don't want to stop genuine customers from transacting you were touching on it there as well around um how fraudsters are getting smarter how can you balance growth and, and fraud protection oh wow um it's been a challenge in Asia, I have to say, especially if you have to support businesses who think the next shiny object that is labeled as a payment conduit needs to be activated tomorrow. Um, 
I think the the idea of universal identity and the ability to identify who that customer is is key, because without that kind of historical, well, we use it for a different purpose. We use it for the ability to sit down and say, "Welcome, Tom. Welcome aboard. Nice to see you again." You know, we we label it from a customer service perspective, but the fact that the data that we use. Uh, tells us that Tom bought uh, a beer last time and he, he bought a t-shirt the next time. Um, it's something else that we do as well because I think we have to kind of hide behind the customer service angle that Kanan speaks of. The ability for us to focus on the customer yet still do what is necessary for the business is, is critical. And the challenge we have is as we modify the different businesses to adapt to the multitude of payment types, um, we've had to look at very different ways to sort of identify who's right, who's wrong, and whether or not they're out for, for a free ride. Um, it's challenging. Um, but identity management is key. Data has been critical. The ability to see data in cross-reference to characteristics of usage and the, how they are actually interacting within the ecosystem is also critical. Um, I think the devices they use are uh, especially important. Device fingerprinting is something we, we, we do heavily because we do realize as you go big in certain segments, um, we've had challenges with bots, for example, who automate in terms of trying to emulate uh, a legitimate customer. Um, unfortunately, when they do come in, they look like, like any legitimate individual anyway. Right? So, We've had to look at the problem from outside in versus inside out because it it just doesn't work anymore the same old way it was. So it, it's been a it, challenge. Oh, that's great! And Danny, if you don't mind, just really quickly, yeah, I'd love I'd love to hear yeah. about Zalora's approach to this. But what Mo's describing, we would call strategic friction. Mm -hmm. So if I, if Zalora has has generously offered me a promotional code. Um, they might welcome me to the site, and then if the identity or some element of it looks suspicious, they might say, welcome, please transact. Oh, and by the way, we want additional information before we allow you to do that. How, how does that play out at Zalora, Canon? I'm curious. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tom, for the question. So um, just to relate back to an experience, like some, sometime year, uh, years back, uh, Dynamic Tree Secure was, was the key. Um, and also one of the exciting offerings in the market, right? So we were trying to, uh, and we thought that, you know, Dynamic 3D Secure is going to solve all our top line problems. And the moment we onboard Dynamic 3D Secure, uh, the cash is just going to flow in. So that's what we thought. And then when we when we actually enabled that, um, we saw there was a stronger need for us to improve our fraud protection. And we had to do some customization towards our existing parameters of the fraud rules that we had. So what we had to do, we had to do, um, as you mentioned, more fingerprinting, device fingerprinting is one of the key ones. And then especially when we look into like change of information, when it happens, example, if the customers are purchasing pattern is slightly different, sending it to a new address, change of phone numbers, and all of this, we will reroute them to, to a normal 3D secure route. Uh, and that's precisely what we have done. Uh, the manual intervention happens quite a bit uh, in Zolora, but I guess Beyond that, I think the couple of keywords that I could think about when I see this question is that uh, when you have a fraud protection, it has to happen at the back end. It has to happen in milliseconds. I mean, and also there should be some some uh, uh, what you call allowances for you to have manual intervention because you'll be amazed to see what a human could could capture. Uh, in the, in terms of the transactions and also in terms of the anonymity in the in the transactions compared to uh, an AI perspective. So and also another surprise that we had here was um, we thought that you know a mature market would have more concerns around fraud and and payment security. But immediately when we launched some of the new or relaxed some of the new measures in in our fraud parameters, we noticed there were high number of comments in in markets that were less developed. And these are markets are more increasingly concerned about the fraud, fraud rather than the, the mature markets because I think the trust has been built that you know the regulatory system or the ecosystem will take care of itself. But in growing markets, we are seeing quite a number of comments. I hope that answers your question, Tom. David, do you want to give some of your thoughts around uh, this point as well? Sure, sure. So I think in my professional career um, in the past 15 years, I've uh, been mostly involved in sales, account management, and working directly with the merchants. And I've seen my fair share of fraud, uh, you know, and 
and disputes and, and charge back. And sometimes it can get really, really scary, especially when a business uh, just want to, you know, go to market without thinking through about the, the process of selling it to the market. Um, and as a salesperson that's actually selling, you know, to the merchant, when I see the merchant having a lot of fraud, I think it, it scares me as well. And and that's why I think uh, it's important to take a calibrated approach when it's, uh, especially when you're selling to the new market or it is your first time, you know, selling online. Um, I've actually, you know, onboarded, acquired a, a merchant that is a traditional jewelry sort of a merchant. They never sell so anything online before. And the first day when they went online, there was like, yeah, it was, it was bad. Like there were so many orders coming from developing markets and uh, all of these orders were like for gold and jewelry and, and whatnot. And uh, needless to say, there was like a huge chargeback and huge disputes. Um, but you know, though, though that's that's one end of the spectrum. Of course, you don't want to be on the other end of the spectrum where you know you're paralyzed by all this uh, analysis and you decide you know to have so much, so much you know the processes and practices that you know it's, it's almost impossible to buy from you. So that same jewelry merchant the next day decided, that, oh my god, you know because of these disputes and, and these transactions, they decided to personally investigate all transactions coming online you know whether is it calling the customer you know sending them taxes making sure that they reconfirm their order so in that sense a lot of there was a lot of false positive people who were trying to buy something legitimately on their website became pissed off right because there was just so much friction so much hassle um and you know to, so really you want to get an approach that's somewhere in the middle and i think this is where you potentially can you know again coming back to working with partners guys that know their staff and and trying to sort of you know, uh, just to just to have a, a good balance so that yeah you, know, you don't piss everybody off. Thanks, Stephen. Um, we're entering the the last kind of uh, ten minutes. I've I've got some more questions for the panel here. But if you, as the audience watching, if you have any questions, feel free to pop it into the into the chat window, and I'll make sure to come to your question uh, as we move into this last uh, section of the of the panel discussion. So. So please do pop any questions you have and I'll, I'll come to your question. Uh, if you want to direct which uh, panelist it wants to be at as well, I'll, I'll direct it to the, the specific person also. Um, so moving into the future then, um, any predictions on what the customers of the near future are going to look like and how can you make sure that you're attracting and you're converting them and, and and you're also keeping them. I think that's crucial, isn't it? You've, you've got to keep customers these days because it's so easy to to jump. And, and once they do jump, they're probably never going to come back, or it'll take a long time to win them back again. So you want to keep them. So can I can I can I come to you to get your thoughts? Yeah, sure. Um, so I guess the, the future customer will be well informed, and I think this equals very well with what Mo have actually mentioned earlier that. You know, customers today are really super smart. They have everything on their fingertips. You know, even even when we talk about the the, the structure of buy now pay later and how this could actually stimulate irresponsible spending and whatnot. But this is not the case, right? Because customers have all the information available to them, how much they are spending, how much they could control a bit more. And I think there are also multiple self personal personal financing help that could help to consolidate or curate uh, some of these offerings. So that that is one. And I think they. In, in the notion of like not having too much choices where customers will eventually drop out, I think we can also look at it from the angle of like how about having more choices where you have different drivers of traffic coming to your uh, site or platform and allowing customers to spend. And I think last but not least uh, would be convenience will be the key to increase the frequency of purchase. And I think a couple of years back um, um, using my phone, right? So you know how convenient Apple Pay is. So it's just a, it's a scan of your face with a double tap on the side and then you get the transactions too. So I was playing this game. Uh, my wife calls it a stupid game. But then again, that's one way of me relieving my stress. So <laughs> over the weeks, right, I was playing and I wasn't having enough so-called like diamonds or something. And, and then eventually what I did, I did double tap once. And over that span of like two to three weeks, then it came to my realization I spent almost about two hundred sing dollars on 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 the on the tokens to really move move me up the ladder. And I see, and I and I thought to myself, what what was the reason for the behavior? And this could could be only one explanation: it's the convenience. Double tap and you get it done. So, I think if you can emulate emulate some of these um, aspects to your platform, that could really help you to to grow the business even further. Agree, completely agree. 
Uh, now, can I get your thoughts on uh, on the future? Oh wow, you do realize we're <laughs> all kind of jammed up right before this. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> But we do see a few things. I think gamification is here to stay. Um, and there's been a lot of um, methodologies that have been used across the board, either from literally games right down to actual retail. Um, the simplification that Kanan speaks of is, is exactly there. I think to some extent, our, our, our thinking around making payments invisible and seamless, and I think to some extent, Grab does a really good job. They never ask you about how you want to pay. They just ask you whether you're sure. And one thing you forget the moment you say yes, your money's gone, um, is, is key. But one thing we do realize is the fact that with the, and all of us can assume that we're still in, you know, either Gen Z or millennials if we really want to be, but we, we definitely will not be able to be identified within that cohort. But these guys actually play along a social um, engagement model more significantly. In the past, we would read about reviews before we would commit. We would sit down and read comparisons before we commit. But the level of information flow is so fast right now. It's gone to a point where it's about you asking your friend and your friend asking their friend. And because of the simplicity about committing now, the transaction happens very, very quickly. But what is also interesting, especially on the fraud piece, Tom, is the fact that because they can commit so quickly, the return and chargeback and refund processes are also expected to be done very, very quickly, right? And I think the consumers now feel that that is actually their right to commit and to be able to return and still have their money back while it's due as well. So I think going forward, the transparency and the consistency around the messaging for a merchant in terms of the value you provide, what you stand for, the messaging around safety and security, is definitely key messages we need to continue to put out there because people now are starting to worry about what you're giving you and, and what you're showing to other people and, and how come you know what's going to happen with them and everything else. So um, the form factor is a given. The level of awareness is there. There will still be a, some recklessness that comes with the gamification component, but we see it all come back as either a chargeback or a refund process. That's going to be a, a little bit of a pain, unfortunately, but. As a merchant, that's almost necessary for us to do. I think for us to sit down and have stronger processes to manage that, especially when you start looking at regionalization is gonna be a challenge for us. Because as the world flattens out, not that I'm a flat earther or anything, but you know, it's, for us as a merchant, our customers can come from anywhere now, right? Um, it is a global marketplace. You know, um, without knowing you'll be serving someone from Singapore, we'll be serving someone from the Philippines, Thailand, it's almost there. It is a legitimate transaction. So we need to be able to create a similar seamless experience. And that's why AirAsia focuses on the individual, focuses on the UI, UX and the experience there. And then we try and find the technology that will allow us to be able to do that business well. Right. So I think that's, that's what my crystal ball is saying before it kind of crapped out. So. Um, we'll have to come back again and, and tell you what the rest of the, the storyline is about, Danny. <laughs> when it's working, I'm, I'm going to have to give you a call when it's fully working. That was, that was, pretty, that was pretty good with, uh, with the damaged one. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. <laughs> Tom, maybe before I come to you on the future, there was a question here from the audience um, from uh, Lisa Glasgow. Um, can blockchain help validate individual identity vis-a-vis e-payments? And, and does Ecarta use this kind of technology? Yeah, so that's actually a great question and it ties into the future, Danny. So you, if you think about, yeah, you think about what we're doing online. We are trying to uh, replicate what, what most consumers prefer, which is a cash payment in person. Yeah, mm -hmm. and merchants do not want to pay fees. Mo, Mo used to work at MasterCard too. So he knows MasterCard is diversifying to identity solutions like Akata because everyone knows the life cycle for credit cards is going to be limited as, as other options are right. The, the other thing that when we're talking about, like, so there's the cash payments in person today, no one is interacting with the internet telepathically. So until we can actually authenticate with our device in a biometrically proven way that can't be hacked or spoofed, there are going to be these middle uh, middle ways and Akata is one of them to verify identities in, in today's commerce, right? 
blockchain. I mean, blockchain is, is has been an amazing technology for, for crypto, um, the advancement of crypto exchanges and a few other technologies. Akata doesn't currently use it, but it is the future where we are able to have a globally adopted framework that everyone has opted into. Right now, it's only used uh, sporadically. So we are still in this middle zone, doing the best we can with the data that we have um, as there's different standards and different operating procedures uh, across the globe. Thanks, Tom. And there's, a, there's another question coming as well from uh, Patrick Chung. Um, do you expect any impact from CBDC to the e-payments? It's not directed at anyone, so I don't know if anyone wants to, wants to tackle that. So CB, the, that acronym, that's the central banking digital currency, correct? Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. I mean, again, like the expansion of, of um, digital currencies, the beauty for B2B payments, there's no, uh, there's no conversion fees, the payment is immediate, so businesses are not waiting. I think the, the, the few national, national uh, banks that are getting into it, it's a fantastic first step. We're still five or 10 years away from it being a widely accepted currency to actually be uh, a player more broadly in e-payments. I, I would agree. I think uh, we were looking yeah. at crypto as an acceptance component as well. And one of the challenges we realize is the likes of CBDC is still very much designed to be single market centric because it is driven by one specific regulator for that specific market, which poses for us especially a very challenging regional footprint solution. We couldn't actually implement it anywhere else. So I guess we then took a proposition to see whether it was going to fly or not before we would jump in you know both legs and 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 put it on but then again i always use the fact that i already have 165 different currency types and i didn't want to do that one extra one <laughs> so <laughs> and i and i think it's not um so much of a technical solve um technically it's probably easy to sort of connect the different digital currencies together but yep. it probably is a more political issue right where you know the countries have to open to each other and you know, talk to each other potentially share certain information with each other so that can be tricky yeah i think even in zalora we, we tried to explore uh crypto, cryptocurrency as an acceptance channels and then we realized that you know similar to what mo had experienced as well like you know the regulatory environment is quite unique in each and every market and then we can't have a single product that serves all the market and also there's quite a bit of uncertainty around it so we decided to maybe take a step back observe it for a while and then you know revisit it somewhere later well we're almost at the end of the session and we've got the uh the ipad uh, mini prize draw to go which i know everyone here is waiting for um just before we we move on to the prize draw i wanted to come to you and literally in 10 seconds 15 seconds if, if there's a final thought you want to leave the the audience with today based on the discussion we've had so mo can i come to you first just a concise final thought um sure i guess for us the most important thing about e-payments is the fact that it is now so generic that we need to look at it from a broader spectrum it's not only about acceptance it's all about the consumer it's all about simplicity it's about uh, usability but I think one thing that we also want to so also include, and I think Stephen mentioned this very briefly, is also it has to be inclusive. No point in making it simple and usable and the fact that it only works for 20-30% of the market. So I think for payments to be successful and for merchants to really benefit, it has to be something everyone's using. It has to be universally accepted. Um, so I think that, that that's where it's heading and I, I'm looking out for it because I think that's going to be such an exciting uh, development for us. Thanks, Mark. Tom? Yeah, for me, cross-border payments is all about feeling a level of comfort with the small businesses or consumers you're interacting with. So finding ways to verify them, uh, increase your confidence to reject fraud. You should feel good about that and not doubt that you're leaving money on the table or allow people to interact and interact with, with uh, chutzpah um, it, within your system because you have that confidence. Thanks, Tom. Stephen? I think consumer experience is super critical. Um, the less steps, the better. Less friction, the better. Uh, of course, it has to be safe as well, but customer experience is super critical. Yeah, completely agree. Canon? 
Yeah, I think the viewpoint in regards to payment is also has to be a bit more holistic, looking into end to end. So especially for merchant like us, where we we consistently shout about our USP, where returns is is key, and also that leads to refund. I think we need to look into both acceptance and also reversal process as a whole, and making it both seamless in both ends, right? So that's that's uh, my parting thoughts. Awesome. Thanks very much, everyone. Really enjoyed the discussion. We better get the uh, the iPad prize draw up. I think uh, my colleague just going to share the screen, and we'll spin the wheel now for the participants to to win it, to stand a chance to win the iPad. Oh, I noticed your name isn't on there. Yeah, because my my crystal ball <laughs> went berserk. Remember, otherwise, yeah. ah, Alfred got it. Alfred won. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations, Congratulations Alfred. Alfred. And share the prize with Bruce, or not. Uh, so thank you very much, everyone, for a fantastic session. I I've really enjoyed it. Um, it does bring us to the end of this e-tail and digital travel, travel summit webinar. I I'd really like to thank Kenan from Zalora, Mo from AirAsia, Tom from Ikata, and Stephen from Payoneer, and of course, everyone for participating and, and making it a great session. Um, if you need any more information or would like to arrange a one-to-one -one consultation uh, with Payoneer or Ikata, please do uh, get in touch with Tom or, or Stephen that, uh, that are on the session today or, or anyone from the Ikata and Payoneer teams would be very happy to help. Uh, and beh on behalf of ETA and Digital Travel Summit, I'd like to say a really big thank you for being here and, and joining us again virtually and, and look forward to seeing you at a future event uh, very soon to continue the conversation with you. So thanks again, everyone, and, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good one, guys. Bye. 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 Thanks. Bye, everyone. <laughs>